I think we, we will have now two, uh, two set of presentation. One, just, uh, and, and I will have the pleasure to introduce uh, Stephanie Fai. So just let me give you some quick, uh, let's say, overview of uh, his, um, what she has done. She's a, a senior scientist at Singapore Institute of Manufacturing Technology. Okay, she's clearly passionate about analysis and lightweight structures, and you will see that during your presentations. Uh, she clearly has a track record on the publication, more than 130 papers published in various journals and seminars. Uh, she's uh, now, she, okay, something which is very, we are all, uh, let's say, from Similia, we are all aware of. She's, uh, in some way, Stephanie holds a degree of mechanical engineering from Darmstadt University in Germany. So that's where we have a strong, <laughs> let's say, office also in Darmstadt with the uh, electron electro uh, CST applica uh, applications there. Uh, she also, not even more, she get a degree of Cornell University, I guess for North American people, it's clearly something which means a lot. And uh, she's also awarded of a PhD from Cambridge uh, University in UK. So she's very across the globe with Germany, UK, and, and North America for his, uh, let's say, cursus. She's member of the Executive Council of the International Committee and Composite IC ICCM. Okay, she's uh, also materials and editorial board member of the composite part A. Stephanie also holds adjunct position at RMIT University and National University of Singapore. So uh, please welcome Stephanie on, on stage. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and let me start by saying that I'm very excited to be here, and thank you so much to Dassault Systems for the opportunity to actually come here today and present about a topic I'm obviously very passionate about. So um, when I got the opportunity to actually st stand here in front of you and present, I was thinking for quite a while how I can share my research journey in the best way with you. And... Um, I spent a bit of time on this slide because I was really trying to say, okay, I've worked in so many different areas and I've been so fortunate to work with so many fantastic colleagues and uh, friends across the globe. And uh, the one theme that we can see, even though it covers composites and aluminium structures and additive manufacturing and joining, is that um, all the work has been focused on lightweight structures, really. And... Uh, as, we, as the introduction said, I've also been very fortunate to actually publish this work so um, in over 140 international journal publications and conferences with my colleagues. So I want to take the opportunity to just um, talk about materials, structures and joining. And I'll talk a bit about trends, but not for too long. And then um, show you really the bulk of this work in terms of case studies for composites, uh, some case studies for additive manufacturing design and also very importantly, the joining of the two together, because with light weighting, it's not enough to just work on materials. We have to think about structures, and if we think about structures, we have to think about joining. And then I want to finish with lessons learned, and probably not just learned, still being learned, because as a researcher, the thing I love most about my job is that every day I learn something new. And that's really what I want to share with you today. A uh, couple of the things I've learned over the last 20 years. Um, and hopefully it will inspire you like it inspires me every day. So a bit about Singapore. Now I realize we are a very small red dot and that's what people call us often. So it's an island, a city-state really, 40 by 20 kilometers roughly. Um, but at the same time, we're very dedicated um, and invested in R&D. And uh, I realize this is Singapore dollars I'm showing here, so you have to take about 30% off for US dollar. But nevertheless, that is still a lot of investment um, at the, in the order of $19 billion at the moment for the current five-year plan in research and development. And of that, we're allocating $3.2 billion to advanced manufacturing and engineering. And under that, of course, falls additive manufacturing and composite structures and so on. 
And I guess this dedication actually shows, so we were just ranked third in the 2018 Bloomberg's Innovation Index. And having been in Singapore for four years now, I can say it really is a hub for international collaboration with multinationals, but also with local industry. So very focused on oil and gas and um, aerospace industry. And uh, fantastic industry and science linkages in terms of research partnerships. Now, SimTech, so the Singapore Institute of Manufacturing Technology, um, falls under ASTAR, so we're part of the Government Research Laboratory, and we have about 450 staff working on manufacturing technology. And um, yeah, so that is across various groups, so a lot of interdisciplinary work going on in various aspects of manufacturing with a very strong focus on light weighting as well. So we haven't seen too many trend slides and I don't want to spend so much time on it, but if we work in lightweight manufacturing and we've heard from the aerospace industry, we've seen work from the car industry, um, but I wanted to show a couple of the drivers here, what is actually happening in the market. So the, the lightweight material market is definitely expanding and that is due to a big demand in aerospace and automotive mostly. And um, especially the Asian region is expected to see a very booming automotive sector over the next years. And of course, with an increase in transportation and um, general market rising, we also have the issue of rising emissions. So what really this light weighting effort is about to a large extent is to reduce emissions while of course also increasing productivity of an aircraft or making the, the car um, basically cheaper to run for the individual user. So a bit about aerospace light rating trends. We had some fantastic um, presentations already yesterday cover, uh, covered from Boeing, but also about composite structures. And uh, I think most of you will know that, of course, we've seen a lot of changes in the aerospace industry from the 747 going forward to the 787. So a very big rise in composite structures, of course, and that is directly related to reduced operating fuel cost if we can save weight on the aircraft. So we've seen a big increase in the use of carbon fiber composites. And um, we're also seeing now increasing use of new lightweight alloys such as magnesium alloys, um, novel aluminum alloys, but also interior polymer and composites, not just structural components. And if we look around what actually the research issues are, um, it comes down again to joining um, flammability, very big problem. And for Singapore, very importantly, repair of the composite structures. So a fuselage section made out of carbon fiber composites is repaired completely differently to an aircraft made out of aluminum. So that raises lots of new and fascinating research points. In terms of automotive, um, the drivers are slightly different. It's mostly due to stringent emission controls and um, the drive from the EU within the US to actually force automotive uh, manufacturers to reduce the emissions from the vehicles. At the same time, the number of vehicles is still increasing, so no matter how much we do, we still have the issue of also having an additional number of vehicles on the road. So mass savings, again, in an automotive vehicle translate into fuel savings and therefore emission reductions. The key um, progress here that um, automotive manufacturers see is the use of hybrid material combination. So we can't just say we're going to make the whole car out of carbon fiber. That is probably not going to be cost effective. But if we're looking at hybrid connections, so carbon fiber with aluminum, with steel in the right locations, that's when it becomes interesting. And that's where the joining becomes very important, of course, and uh, automated assembly and new manufacturing processes. But if we do all this light weighting, we also run into new challenges, such as durability, vibrations, vehicle dynamics, and we've seen fantastic simulations already that take basically all these things into consideration and do an optimization of all those um, processes. So then, of course, additive manufacturing, is it a key enabler for design innovation? I will show you some examples as a person who loves structures and optimization, I think additive manufacturing is fantastic because I have the opportunity to go out there and print the new designs and actually test them and see if what I've simulated translates into the, um, the improved performance that I've actually, um, that I'm expecting to see. Uh, in Singapore, again, we do a lot of work for the aerospace industry 
and of course here with AM parts we face a lot of um, certification issues and uh, we actually have to demonstrate repeatability and consistent supply chain and also the issue of recycling of powder. All these things come into it, it's not just the design and the improved performance of the part for one single part. And of course then we have to consider mechanical and fatigue properties um, as well and um, yes, there will be research for the next years to come in this field and additive manufacturing will only increase in use. Now, where does numerical simulation come into all this? Um, I have had quite a few PhD students and they always start with the first point. So let's actually try to predict what we're seeing in an experiment, in a structure, with our simulation. And after they spend a lot of time on that, they get very excited when it finally matches up. But that is only the start. That's where it becomes really interesting because now if we actually manage to get the material um, performance right, the structural performance right, we now have the opportunity, let's do design optimization, let's do failure prediction, let's link it to process simulation, let's look at manufacturing defects, let's look at material characteristics. And we have all these tools nowadays that we can utilize for all these various aspects. So in my case studies that I will show you after this, I'm touching on all of these uh, as far as I can. But the one thing I really want to highlight is that simulation results have to advance our understanding of the structural performance. It's not enough to just match the experimental result of a structure we already know or have in service. We really need to take advantage of the next step onwards and improve the design and validate the improved design. So I want to start with a couple of case studies on composite design, manufacture and repair. And again, there are so many research topics that I think are interesting that I've worked on, but I'll focus on the ones where we've nicely linked numerical and experimental um, results. And I want to start with a fairly old one. So this is actually based on my PhD, so quite a while ago. But recently this has become a very hot topic again. So it's actually about manufacturing defects. So I was working in joining and uh, the one thing that we saw when we actually manufactured these fairly thick and uh, small radius pieces was that the carbon fiber layers did not align so nicely with the tight radius, especially on the inner radius side. But we actually saw wrinkling and we also saw layer expansion. So the question was, can we actually determine the effects of wrinkling and layer spreading on mechanical properties? Now keep in mind that was in 2002, so at that point analysis was definitely not as far progressed as nowadays. And um, we actually did a couple of tests, so some under bending, some under tension, and the one thing we noticed was there was a lot of variation in the results. Way too much variation for our liking, way too much variation for an aerospace industry, that actually needs to have very well certified parts. So the question was, why does this happen? Is this linked to the manufacturing defects? We assumed yes, but obviously it was something that we wanted to confirm. So we actually generated some models, and you will see this was again uh, early 2000. We generated them with Patron. And um, we looked at wrinkles, and we looked at layer spreading, and um, we did s fairly simple stress analysis at that point um, with uh, in-plane composite damage. And the one thing is, well, if you have a nicely aligned layer, um, all no wrinkles, nice spreading, you get a very nice stress profile. If you have wrinkles present, the stress concentration factor increases significantly. So here in the picture, uh, if you can see the number by about a factor of two and a half. And we basically did a study, and this would have not been possible experimentally, where numerically we varied the number of layers in the wrinkle, the wrinkle widths, and we looked at the stress factors, stress intensity factors, so to speak, that were being created compared to the perfect piece. And it was very obvious that even within the manufacturing defects we were seeing, if there were wrinkles present, then we could actually get a strength knockdown of up to about 25%, 30%, and that agreed very well with what we saw in the experiments as well. Um, layer spreading in comparison was actually not that critical because the fiber volume fraction decreases but the thickness increases so it kind of compensated for it. Now that was then, nowadays this actually becomes a big topic again. We're trying to automate manufacturing processes, we're trying to produce composite parts that are fairly thick um, through thermoforming processes. But nowadays the process simulation has picked up and um, I want to show some very nice work from the University of Bristol here just published earlier this year, 
where they actually looked at the various thicknesses. They have a very nice material model for the pre prex system they're using. And based on thickness, they could actually predict different types of manufacturing defects. So everything comes together in a circle. Process predicts the manufacturing defects. Um, analysis predicts the knockdown in properties. And hopefully we can close the loop and actually show that if we change the material, um, for example, we optimize the material, we optimize the process conditions, these kind of manufacturing defects are minimized and we actually um, have a much more controllable material property as an outcome. Now, something about joining. So here we were looking at um, composite T-joints, similar to the ones I was just showing before, and we thought, okay, the failure mechanism is really not um, very good because it's catastrophic failure and basically you rip off the joint piece that you just attach to your base plate. And we thought, surely we can do this in a better way. And we were looking to nature. And uh, my PhD student at that point was studying trees. And she said, well, let's look at how a tree actually grows a joint. It doesn't just attach it on the outside. It actually grows it from the center of the trunk. And the areas in the high colors on the left pictures there, that's where the density of the fibers are actually higher. So the tree will align the fiber direction optimally. It will increase the density where needed. And we thought that is something we can mimic to a certain extent. So rather than just do a standard joint where we attach our L pieces and just connect them with adhesive, we were actually embedding them into the parent material in the trunk. And then we were testing them under um, bending loading and under peel loading. Um, then we thought, okay, this is not enough. We actually need to, like the tree, optimize our layup as well. Again, this is not something we could easily do experimentally. So this is where simulation comes in. And at that point, we didn't have eyesight, so we used mode frontier, but that doesn't matter. It's the same kind of task, where we actually look to optimize the different ply angles to give us minimal through thickness stresses. And therefore, that was the hypothesis. Um, we would get a better strength of the joint. And um, that, in fact, did happen. So we came up with a fairly unorthodox layup. And I would say at that point, it probably wasn't something that industry would like to do. Nowadays, with automation um, and automated fiber steering and layup, uh, this is much easier to achieve. And um, we actually highlighted that we can, yes, save weight of 25%. We can increase the strength of the joint. But more importantly, actually, for an adhesive joint, once first failure happens, we can actually completely recover the strength and the second failure peak is going to have higher strength than the first one. And that means that if you have an accidental overload and you introduce cracking, the structure actually doesn't, doesn't um, there's no danger of the structure failing catastrophically because we know that the next peak is going to be higher than the first. And that is a very important thing for adhesive joining to actually have this kind of hierarchical failure mechanism where you can recover strength after first failure occurs. And that is not something that we typically see with composite joints that are just connected with an adhesive layer. Okay, so into the last case study in here, let's talk about composite repair, a very, very big topic. Um, what we were looking at here is like, yes, we know we can repair a structure. Um, the way we do that is we scarf um, the damage out and we put a new patch on and we have a very good understanding of what the strength of this repair is. But what if there's actually an accidental second damage occurring in the same area? That was something that hadn't been investigated before. And is the adhesive layer um, prone to damage in that case? What happens with the interaction of composite and adhesive damage? How can we actually characterize that? And uh, so we did quite a few impact tests on our scarfed bond line. And we did a lot of experimental studies and C scanning studies to study the failure that occurred. And we could see a lot of delamination between the plies. And uh, of course, we were planning to actually validate this numerically. And uh, so we created a model that uh, in, in 3D that had all the relevant parts in it. We initially did an elastic impact in explicit. We were able to match the elastic response very well. And then we did things we couldn't do experimentally. So we said, okay, what happens if we actually try to match the, the damage first now? How do we characterize that for the adhesive layers? We, we could do that. So we could look at the delamination toughness and characterize that under different types of impact conditions. So we had a toughness for the composite. We established a toughness for the adhesive. 
And uh, from that, we actually did some little mind games. And we said, okay, what happens first? Adhesive damage or delamination damage? Okay, first the composite is damaged because its fracture toughness is lower. That's interesting because if the composite damage is first, that's non-catastrophic. Adhesive damage is actually fairly catastrophic. So to some extent, the composite takes up energy that would otherwise damage the adhesive layer. And if we actually do a couple of little studies, we can show numerically that the composite damage delays and protects the adhesive joint in the structure. So from that, we can actually think further and say, okay, we could actually do more things like try to introduce purposely design the composite in such a way that in the critical areas, for example, it takes up, uh, it absorbs energy before the repair fails. So that was a very important outcome that without simulation you can't achieve because you can't separate the two things in the experiment. So, but by validating it against numerical results, we could see which failure mechanism was dominant. Okay, so um, let's finish the composite structures and uh, move on to additive manufacturing case studies. The, the reason how I actually started in this was that I was looking at sandwich structures. And uh, of course, lattices are very important in sandwich structures and generally we use honeycomb materials. And um, I was saying, okay, we have a great 3D printer, let's do some metallic lattices and actually see how we can predict the performance and if they are better than our standard honeycomb structures and what can we learn from this and um, of course there's always a question what kind of lattice do we want to use there's so many different types and do we want to test them all can we predict them how do we select the best lattice for a given application what is the performance of these structures we know the bulk performance um, but what about the performance of these fairly thin structures so the diameters are in the order of half a millimeter is the structure on this scale the same as the microstructure? I mean, as the macrostructure? How do we test it? Um, here's some, in again, bio inspiration where we said, okay, these little Kagomi structures, they look a bit like bone structures. Are they better than other structures? Um, what do we do? Okay, so we started testing and printing. We looked at metallic um, failure, we did under compression, we did under shear, and we wanted to characterize this. So the first thing we did was to say, okay, let's actually look at standard tensile specimen. Uh, we can do this in Abacus Explicit, we can put in a ductile failure model. Uh, we used the failure model with triaxiality, so where the failure strain depends on the stress state. That is very important if we're looking at tension and compression and shear the failure strain will be different. The input curve is the same, but the strain values uh, where damage and basically failure happens is different. And for the bulk material, we could actually predict this very well and we calibrated the model. And uh, generally we were seeing very similar trends to cast material, just the failure strain was a bit lower and that is due to the fact that under additive manufacturing, you actually get a different microstructure. It's a bit more, um, martensitic for titanium 6.4, this wasn't heat treated, so the failure strains were lower. Okay, but does this failure model now translate to the failure model for the lattice structures? So let's try. So um, my student had to go, because of the size, I think I made him do these tests about 10 times and he wasn't happy. But the problem was to actually measure the strains accurately during the compression testing. And when he finally got the agreement, of course, he was very happy. And uh, the main problem there was, as I said, the resolution of the strain measurement equipment compared to the simulation. So initially, our stiffnesses weren't the same. Um, the second issue was that the uh, manufacturing process um, is not exactly the same dimension as actually designed, so when we print these very thin structures of about half a millimeter, they don't turn out exactly round, they come out a bit more elliptic, and that made a difference as well. So he spent a lot of time characterizing the real structure, but there's no data fudging in here, so this is the real dimension used, and proper strain measurements from the experiment lead to very good result with the numerical um, predictions. But what we can see now in the numerical analysis is quite a few steps that occur. So we have um, even way past buckling um, occurrence, we actually have damage initiating. We can numerically determine where that damage initiates. We can also see it on the high speed camera. It occurs in these little regions of um, buckling where the tensile stresses are the highest. 
And if we actually look under the scanning electron microscope at these fracture surfaces, we also see that we have a tensile region for initiation and we have a compressive region exactly as the stress contour plot reveals. So this was for um, compression. We did the same thing for shear and exactly the same material model, no changes. And um, we could see again, we could predict this very well. And the surface in this case was, um, we could see nice shear patterns and also the numerical analysis showed that this was shear. But of course, this is not enough. So what we could see here is that we have different stress states on fracture surfaces. What we could also see was that the diameter of the lattice plays a role. That's important to consider. And uh, the stress state actually changes if we change the diameter. Um, and therefore, the whole failure might shift because of the triaxiality and the dependence of the failure strain on the triaxial stress state. But we can do more. So now we can actually rank. Um, we did experiments to validate all this, but of course we can use the numerical model to do a lot more. We can vary diameters. Um, we can uh, look at the energy absorption. Uh, we can look at the strength. And all this is in specific terms, so we've divided by the weight, so we can actually see the proper um, performance of the structure. In the publication, we've also put this on an Ashby plot, so you can see how the structures actually perform in uh, various categories in terms of strength and stiffness. And generally what we found was that the Kagomi structures performed better than other types of lattice structures. So that was giving us a nice indication. From this work, we actually validated what good lattice structures look like. And we also proved that the ductile failure models for bulk material apply for very thin diameters as well. And that was something quite novel because nobody had actually done that at this point. But of course, we can go further. Next question. If this fails under buckling, why do we make the diameters uniform? We have additive manufacturing. Yes, any other manufacturing process, you would keep the diameter uniform. But AM can print in varying diameters. So therefore, why not actually change the cross-section while keeping the weight the same? Will that help? What is the optimal cross-section variation under compression? And can we link this all to 3D printing and STL files? So my current student um, has been working on that very hard and he came up with an approach with Fourier transformation to actually describe the diameter variation in an STL file, so on a surface file. And um, the question was now, okay, we can describe the geometry, uh, we can do an optimization, we want to maximize the buckling problem and we want to keep the volume the same. So how do we do this in Abacus? So we have a fairly complex flow chart here and the reason for that is that there's a MATLAB process in there, but there's also the STL process and sometimes the meshing for the STL is just not good enough, so we need to do a bit of mesh repair. So that's why we have MeshLab sitting in the middle, but it's an automated process where um, we generate the surfaces in MATLAB. We then import it via MeshLab um, into Abacus and get the buckling result out of it and then put it back into the MATLAB optimizer or it could be the eyesight optimizer and everything is linked together with eyesight. Um, what you can see is some animations here of um, single rods and also our Kagomi structures showing what the outcome is of this diameter variation. It's quite subtle. It's not that we're cutting, we're making things very big and very small somewhere. So it's just a very small variation of the thickness. And uh, we also put some manufacturing constraints on it because we obviously can't print too thin. So there are some limits to additive manufacturing. So the results here that we basically see is a buckling, um, so a single rod under buckling, and then we can see that where the bending moment is the highest, we're actually trying to make the structure thicker, and where the bending moment is the smallest, we're actually making the structure thinner. And um, the buckling um, loads as a result go up for the same um, volume. And we're getting actually significant buckling load improvement, improvements. As an engineer, I say anything larger than 20% is pretty good for the same weight. And we also validated this experimentally. Again, this was very hard because um, these are quite fine structures and to measure all this properly during the test, especially as far as buckling is concerned, things need to be aligned very carefully. So we validated it for the Kagomi, but also for the single column that we actually get very good agreement what, what, with what FE analysis predicted and what um, the experimental results showed. But that's not enough. So this is just the unit cell now. 
So the question that we've been asking really the whole time is, what is better? Topology optimization, and I did bring some samples. Topology optimization or lattices? Same weight. Which approach do we actually want to use? What is the better answer? And we've heard a lot of um, lectures by different people and the general consensus at the moment is that lattices can help with compressive strength because they improve buckling, as we just saw. And, um, but the stiffness is generally lower. So what we were asking ourselves is, okay, if we look at current software, what software does is that we put a regular lattice infill into our structures. And then we do a size optimization. So we change the diameters where more load is needed. We generally do not know what the best lattice structure is. So we try a lot of them and software will give us lots of different options of what we can put in. But that is not how nature works. So back to the tree example or back to any kind of natural example, a sea sponge for example, what we can see is that the lattice cells change in orientation, they change in size. So why are we trying to create structures that have regular cells? Additive manufacturing doesn't need regular cells. This is currently a engineering approximation that makes our life a bit easier. How do we design lattices with varying cells and various alignment? And can we actually get better stiffness and strength if we do so. And the answer is simply yes. So I want to talk you through this a bit. So the workflow we have adopted with an in-house code is that we have our FE code perform topology optimization. We then um, assign through after the topology optimization the regions that should be void, so no material, the region that should be solid, and the regions that we want to be lattice. And we have a fairly good understanding now of what these parameters are, but those are user inputs. And then we have an in-house code that will calculate based on the stress state in 3D, or any varying um, 3D volume, where we actually should align our um, lattice elements. So the MATLAB code at this point will generate a mesh out of beam elements that then can be imported back into our FE code and the FE code can do lattice shape and size optimization. So the way this works in 2D, as a simple example here, just to highlight it a bit more, is if we have a three-point bending beam, we can see that the stress lines are quite simple in this case. So we could align our beam elements with those stress lines. And if we do the same thing in 3D, we have a bit more of a complex algorithm, but basically the algorithm creates the stress lines in 3D and it then merges and puts the right distance in depending on the stress magnitude. And then at the end, we also do a, uh, a size optimization and a shape optimization. So all the nodes get placed in the optimum um, locations within a varying um, box movement. And we're also optimizing the diameters. The one thing we see here is that the diameters actually stay a lot more uniform than with the other processes. And um, one can imagine that if we can play with the size orientation, so with the size of the cell and the orientation, um, that means that actually the diameter variations have to be a lot less to lead us to an optimal stress state. And as I said, we can do this in full 3D now. So one of the examples I have here is the 3D lattice. In this case, we actually find very interestingly as a side effect that the lattices we are creating can also act as a functional support structure. So we actually need for these samples less support than for the standard topology samples if we want to print them in powder bed. Of course, just doing it numerically is not enough. We need to validate this. So we show here a 2D example of just a uniform regular lattice, diameter graded, so where we do the size optimization, and then our um, spatially graded lattice, as we call it. And what you can see is that the stiffness and strength for this example actually go up. So the discussion we had the whole time was that the stiffness of a lattice is generally lower than for the topology optimization. And we can show that not in all cases, but for quite a few load cases, especially when distributed loads are concerned, with the alignment of the lattice in 3D, we can actually match the stiffness of the solid topology optimization. Also taking into account that we're not just filling the whole space with lattice, but we're actually smart about what is void, what is solid, and what is our lattice space. But quite a few of the space still comes out as lattice generated. And um, yes, as a result, we can improve the strength and stiffness, especially under compression. 
Um, this algorithm is not just useful for lattices and 3D AM. So um, we've seen the Airbus example of this little spoiler um, that had a regular lattice infill. I do have an example of this one here printed as well. Um, not sure how easy it is to see on the, on the screen. So regular infill, bio-inspired or stress-based um, lattice infill. This one has a higher stiffness than this one um, by about 75%. So there's significant advantages to aligning the, um, the lattice or the ribs in this case with the stress state to improve the stiffness. So I'm not saying that in these cases the lattice is always the best option, but sometimes we do need lattices, especially for these kind of rib reinforcements. Sometimes we want multifunctional structures where we want a high surface area for heat exchangers, other problems. So we want to make the most out of our lattice structure. Uh, currently, we're trying to think about how we combine our non-uniform thickness with all the spatial arrangement, but uh, that's very complicated in the current context of STL files to achieve because, as people have talked about, STL files for so and so many lattice um, trusses and all the joints are really pushing our computers to the limit at the moment um, in terms of being able to print the structures we design. So for the last case study, I want to talk about hybrid interfaces. Because I said, we have had the composites. We've talked about the metal. Now let's put the two together. What do we actually do here? And what we want to achieve is ideally a joint that doesn't rely on fasteners, especially when we talk about composite structures. Reason is fairly simple. Composites do not like holes. So if we put a hole in our structure, we interrupt the fibers. And um, we want to find a better process of joining composites. However, in aerospace structures, joints or any kind of joint structure cannot fail catastrophically. So generally, an adhesive joint has no crack arresting mechanism, and that is not allowed in a primary structure. You have to be able to detect the crack during inspection. You have to be able to have a chance to repair it. You can't just have catastrophic failure. So something we were thinking about here is that we said, OK, now we're working on topology optimized structures. We're printing them in any case. We want to combine them with a composite. Why are we thinking about bolts? Why do we design this with bolts? It makes no sense whatsoever because we have all the design freedom we want. So if we want to put it in a composite structure, why not be a bit smarter with the connecting surface? And the main, the, the, the one reason really here is that we could use integrated pins across the bonded surface. So these pins are supposed to intersect with our composite and um, really give us the bond that is much better than just an adhesive bond line with an adhesive film. But lots of questions. So what should be the size of the pin? What should be the density of the pins? What are the pins doing to the composite? They are interrupting the fiber alignment, not as bad as a hole, but of course they're still doing the insertion process. The fibers will wave around the pin, so we can't make the pin too thick. And um, the last thing we definitely do not want is the pin fracturing. We want the pin to pull out in the case of damage. So how do we design all this? And again, simulation comes to rescue, of course, because these are things we can study with our simulation tools. So let's look at this. What we did was to actually do a lot of testing of a single pin on a metal printed at various angles. And we put a composite on top. And then we pulled the composite off. And if we do that, we get what we call a bridging law. So we can measure the force required to pull out, and we can use the bridging law to put in as a spring, so to speak, into our um, joint. It can be a DCB. It could be any other type of joint. What we need to know is what is that bridging law. We can do a lot of experiments, but it would be much nicer to have a full model that actually predicts this. So um, again, PhD students are very useful, and um, Alex did a fantastic job on this, uh, now Dr. Alex. And um, he um, predicted, so he created a full fidelity model with um, an angled pin, pulling out of a composite, looking at the stresses in the pin, having ductile failure of the pin, but also having composite failure included, so he could see what's happening in the composite at the same time, and that was all experimentally validated through tomography, but also through the load displacement curves. And again, there's a lot more things we can pick up from the FE model compared to the experiment. We can see that initially we have progressive pullout of the pin, 
depending on the angle. Um, then we have bearing against the resin, then we have resin crushing, we have plastic pin deformation, and all this contributes to the pull-out mechanisms and the energy absorbed during pull-out. So much more than we can actually just get from our experiment. And we can now use this to actually optimize the pin length, the pin diameter in our composite structure. And we can see that the maximum energy we get if we pull the pin out completely and what we have to do to avoid pin fracture. So depending on the thickness of the composite, we can then design the diameter of the pin and we can design the um, spacing of the pins. And we can then see on the last graph here that we can introduce or increase the mode one fracture toughness significantly. If we don't just have mode one stresses, but also shear stresses, we adjust the angle of the pin. So the model can actually predict all this as well. So fantastic outcomes here. Um, that was my little journey linking together various aspects of material and structure and joining. Now, the lessons learned um, or still um, in the learning process is that bridging this gap between finite element analysis and experiments takes a very long time. It takes much longer than just doing the experiments and takes much longer than just doing the simulations. So these nice agreements that you see here, and there's actually no fudging of data here, but going back to do the experiment, going back to adjust boundary conditions in the simulation, going back to try and change boundary conditions in the experiment because we know there's a bit of movement which is actually decreasing our stiffness that is not present in the FE model. That's what takes time. And often creates a lot of frustration that just needs to be overcome. And then we have to learn somehow, if we have that finite element analysis, what is now the valuable information that you're getting out of this? So go back to the FE model, study it. What are the abnormalities? What are the things that you saw in the experiment you couldn't explain? And now you can because you have the simulation. It's not enough to just match it. Learn from it and then improve the design. Try new design spaces, new design parameters. But once you've done it, once you've optimized the design, make sure that you do your experiment again to make sure you haven't actually created a new failure mode or a new, um, a new scenario that you hadn't considered in your FE analysis, which can happen very quickly. So I think what I've shown in all my um, results is that, yes, we can improve the design, and then we go back and we validate it with experiments. And at the end of this, I would like to thank, of course, all my fantastic co-workers that I've had the pleasure to work with, all the fantastic students, most of which now have graduated and have great career in aerospace and other engineering fields. And um, with that, I would just like to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you.